If you're not lucky. Can you really just say your mom? I said a lot of it. You said it to the country on YouTube. The world. Lucky to America's mom. Okay, England. All right, you guys can jump around and we can start late, but I'm gonna teach until I'm done. And we will be here until eight. Okay, so you just decide when you want to be quiet. Okay, so um, so last last time. Last time we uh, talked about trying to address this issue in the standard model that if we want to base things on symmetry arguments, like the principle of local gauge invariance, then we are of course forced to have massless gauge bosons. And that flies in direct contradiction, or directly it con contradicts observation that at least for the weak interactions, the gauge bosons are massive. And then we also learned that uh, because the weak interactions are based on an SU2 left symmetry, then uh, the mass terms for fermions, that is all matter, would have to be zero. So there was this, in general, a mass problem. Nothing seems to be able to have mass. And so we learned last time, through this complicated convoluted argument, that if you include in the Lagrangian a Higgs field with a certain potential, then through some mathematical magic, uh, for certain solutions, things could acquire mass. And what I'm going to aim to do today is to give you a pictorial representation of that mechanism, which I think is going to give you something to anchor your understanding to and make it much more intuitive, or <coughs> as intuitive as possible. But then also connect this to the idea that somehow the mechanism of things getting mass is tied to breaking symmetry. Okay? So, uh, so what do we mean when we talk about breaking symmetry? Um, in particular, uh, and we'll, we'll clarify this later, it's the notion of a spontaneously broken symmetry. Um, but let me start with sort of a, a, a discussion of uh, how you can have a symmetry be present, Spencer. <laughs> Turn around. You, you can, trust me, you can. Forget. Just so you know, Blondie over here is trying to do quantum mechanics on that board while I'm teaching <laughs> particle physics on this board, and I know you're not that good of a multitasker, so pay hey, attention. So, um, no one's that good of a multitasker. It's not a personal insult. Okay, so what I want to first argue to you is that it is possible for a physical theory to have a symmetry, even though our experience of the physical theory does not reflect that symmetry, okay? So uh, just to give you a, a really simple idea, so we're gonna take a scalar field, and so we're gonna have some scalar field Lagrangian, and this thing is already good. We're gonna take a scalar field Lagrangian, so we know we're gonna have the usual Klein-Gordon kinetic term. And then we're going to give this thing some potential, V phi. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a particular potential of the following form. Uh, v phi is going to be minus one half phi squared plus one fourth phi to the four. Okay. Now, this is a real scalar field. This is not a complex scalar field like we talked about last time. I'm going to make connections to that in a moment. But for, for right now, this is literally a degree of freedom, which is just a number. Okay. And it's, of course, a function of where you are but it's a scalar function of where you are. So it's literally just one degree of freedom. And then here's the potential for that field. And then we can actually, of course, plot this. So we can plot the potential as a function of the field value. And you, you, know, you probably have an idea of what that looks like. But. So it's small phi, it's dominated by the negative quadratic. And then for large phi, it's dominated by the quartic term. They have opposite signs, and so you get this nice uh, double well type potential. Um, and we uh, can immediately try to f solve uh, the equations of motion from this Lagrangian, and like we did last time, we can just sort of do it quick and dirty and focus on particularly simple solutions in the form of constant field configurations. What, Wolfgang? Really? I'm getting all these back? Kowalski's not here. Franco's not here. Wow. Okay. A lot of people missing some good stuff here. 
So uh, if we assume a constant field configuration, then we can just ignore the derivative terms. And then extremizing the action based on this Lagrangian really just boils down to for phi constant, it just amounts to extremizing the potential. OK? But graphically, you can do that trivially, right? What are the solutions of this in terms of this graph? Those three dots. Yeah, there are the three dots. This corresponds to phi equals minus 1. This corresponds to phi equals 0. And this corresponds to phi equals plus 1. OK? So those are the three values of the field where a constant value of the field satisfies the equations of motion. <coughs> and that should make sense. If I tried to make this a constant value of the field, it's not going to remain there. It's going to evolve. Okay? But if I stick it at either of any of these equilibrium points, it's just going to stay there happily forever and always. Okay? So um, now let me just ask the following question. This is actually, let me grab some cards. Oh, and look, Matt Kowalski's there. Uh, Caleb, where are you? Caleb, uh, does this potential enjoy any kind of symmetry? Uh, yes. Yeah, what kind of symmetry would you say this potential enjoys? Uh, starts with me. Huh? Even? Yeah, it's even in what? Oh, <laughs> It, it's even in phi, right? If I take the whole thing and I flip it around the phi equals zero axis, it looks the same. Okay, good, awesome. <laughs> Patrick, Murray, Patrick, would you th argue in some sense that any of these three solutions do not enjoy the symmetry of the potential? Or do some of them enjoy the symmetry of the potential? So the symmetry of the potential is if I take phi to minus phi, I get the same thing. Yeah, they get the symmetry. So if I take the, the solution to be phi equals minus 1, and then I send phi to minus phi, does the solution change? What? Phi changes, but there's still a solution to the exponent. But is it the same solution? It's not the same solution. Okay, what about here? But it's not the same solution. What about here? It is. It is. Okay, so one of these three solutions actually enjoys the symmetry of the potential itself, while two of the solutions do not. Well, I'm sorry, what is this a plot of? <laughs> <laughs> this is a plot of this potential function. So why is it not zero at phi equals zero? Because zero plus zero. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're right, you're right, you're right. My zero should be here. Go well, go well, go well. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I did, yeah, I actually drew it that way in my notes. That was horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so, but, but does everyone understand this point that at least one of the solutions has the symmetry of two of them? No. Yes, Spencer. No. When you say, <laughs> okay, no, I don't understand. What is the symmetry? The symmetry of the potential is that v of minus phi equals v of phi. That's the symmetry of the potential. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm asking, does the solution enjoy that symmetry? So if I take phi equals minus one and I send that to minus itself that becomes phi equals 1. Is that the same solution I started with? Okay. No. Similarly, if I start with phi equals plus 1, it becomes phi equals minus 1, which is a different solution. But if I start with phi equals 0, and I send it to minus itself, it's still phi equals 0. So this solution is not related to the value of the potential, is related to the value of phi? Well, phi is the thing that you're solving for. It is the solution. Okay. V is the potential which governs the physics, but phi is the solution to the differential equations. Hmm. Phi is a space-time scalar field. Yes. Okay. okay. Now we can. This idea of the solution not sharing the symmetry of the potential, we can really uh, make even more pronounced if we consider the following. So, again, when we actually do perturbative physics, 
we think not about the whole field configuration, but more about small fluctuations. Okay? So as, our, as per our discussion last time, what we prefer to do is, or what we typically do is think about a new field, phi of x, which uses a solution to the classical equations, and then we perturb in small fluctuations about that solution. Okay? Since we're only thinking of constant solutions, this doesn't depend on position, but the fluctuations do, therefore the new field does. Okay? So if we take this and shove it into the Lagrangian, then what we find is that um, when I take the derivative term here, okay, for each of these, I'm just going to insert that thing. Delta phi has position dependence. I'm not going to keep writing that. Okay, when I when I foil this out, any time the derivative is paired up with phi naught, that term vanishes because phi naught's constant. So that means that this quadratic term vanishes, the mixed terms vanish, and the only thing that survives is the derivative of the fluctuations. Okay. But then, of course, I have to shove it into the potential. And when we shove it into the potential, we have minus 1 half phi naught plus delta phi squared plus 1 fourth uh, phi naught plus delta phi to the fourth. Okay? And now we can think about what that particular, this, so this is just in general. This is for any phi naught. So now I can take these, uh, I can take two of these solutions. We can take this solution and maybe this solution. Okay, and so we can say, okay, the Lagrangian for the solution phi equals zero is just going to be one half d mu delta phi d mu delta phi minus, and then the phi naughts are zero, so this is just minus one half delta phi squared plus one fourth delta phi to the fourth. And by contrast, if I choose the plus one solution, then my Lagrangian is going to be. Okay, now observe. Is there a problem with what I wrote? I think should all of your uh, your potential terms on the on the hand side have a minus sign, like an overall minus sign? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're right. Uh, the one half should be positive. Right? Uh, hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. It it doesn't it, it doesn't matter so much, but yeah, I mean, okay. It's not going to impact the the discussion we're about to have. So, if I now consider these two Lagrangians for the fluctuations, do these Lagrangians for the fluctuations? Notice it's the fluctuation in phi that's the field now. Do these two Lagrangians share the symmetry of the original Lagrangian? Well, one of them does and one of them doesn't, right? This first Lagrangian enjoys the symmetry of phi goes to minus delta phi, right? Because it's quadratic, quadratic, and quartic, okay? However, this Lagrangian does not share that symmetry. If you send phi goes to minus phi in this expression, since this is 1 plus delta phi, it becomes 1 minus delta phi, and that square is not going to help you. That's a different potential. Okay? This is just a reflection of what we said here. This solution enjoys the same symmetry as the original potential. This solution does not. And all I'm pointing out is that that is reflected in the fluctuations about those solutions. Okay? The fluctuations are, you start here and you just move a little bit away, so that's your delta phi. Or you start here and you move a little bit away, that's your delta phi. Okay? There's a certain sense in which the picture says that. The fluctuations here are symmetric. The fluctuations here are not symmetric about zero. Okay? 
All right? Now, here's the important thing. The physics, the underlying physics is defined by this. So when we say there is or isn't a symmetry, we should be pointing to this, the potential in the Lagrangian. Our experience of the physics is determined by these. What does the physics of the small fluctuations look like? And the point is that our experience, particularly in this case, might seem as if there is no symmetry, when in fact there really is a symmetry underlying what's going on. Okay? So this is the context in which we can say there is a symmetry, but that symmetry has in some sense been broken. It's still there, it still governs the form of everything, but we don't see it explicitly, we don't see it manifestly in the physics that we actually encounter. Okay? All right. Any questions about that before we move on? Spencer. So, can you remind me of the motivation of looking at why phi itself doesn't have a symmetry of phi? Like, of course, this, of course the x-axis doesn't have symmetry if you flip the x-axis. Like, phi going from negative one to one is definitely not, like, B will stay the same. So why is it helpful to consider that? Like, um, I don't think I understand your question. So you can you said that V, the potential, has a symmetry. Sure. By flipping its argument, V. Yes. And then you asked, does V have the same symmetry? I ask, do a particular solutions to the equations of motion enjoy the same symmetry. What does that mean? That means I solve the equations of motion and I got three values. Phi equals minus one, phi equals plus one, and phi equals zero. Okay. I'm not asking if phi itself as an abstract variable enjoys that symmetry. I'm asking if these particular values, these solutions enjoy that symmetry. Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. For two of them, for one of them it does. And that's the Lagrange, that's what the Lagrange is. Well, well, once I've picked solutions, I can then talk about, well, what does the physics of the fluctuations around those solutions look like? And then that's how we do this expansion of the, expansion of the field in terms of fluctuations about a solution. We take this, cram it into the original Lagrangian, and then a lot of terms disappear because the finites are constants. And then we're left with something that's in terms of delta phi's. And that's the Lagrangian for the fluctuations. So when you say the equations of motion are solved for like phi plus one or the minus one, I guess they behave the same. So why isn't that a symmetry? Like whatever your motion is in the potential would be the same whether or not you're in the plus one or the minus one. I'm just, I'm just saying the original potential had a symmetry of sending phi to minus phi. I'm not trying to say there's a symmetry of something over here doing something. Like literally, that is the concrete symmetry I'm observing. I can take the potential for a value of phi, and if I send phi to minus phi, the potential has the same value. And then I'm just asking for that particular transformation, do these Lagrangians have the same symmetry? And the answer is no. So, so I, I, I will agree with you that, yes, fluctuating here is, in a sense, going to look like fluctuations here. Like, they look kind of the same. But, but I, I need a, a strict mathematical definition of the transformation I'm talking about and whether that transformation is still a symmetry. And sending phi to minus phi is a symmetry of this potential and Lagrangian built from it but it is not a symmetry of the fluctuations about one of those. Okay? I, I mean, I, at, at a certain level, you just have to make a precise mathematical statement and then follow its consequences. I agree with you, though, that it, yeah, it looks the same between the left and the right. Okay. I thought I saw a hand going up, but maybe not. All right, so, um, 
So everything that I have just talked about um, should be somewhat familiar, right? Last time we met, we took a Lagrangian for a complex scalar field. Okay. Which we eventually called the Higgs field. And then we took a we took a potential that was actually of the form of that. And then there was a, I think, a mu, which we struggled <laughs> to interpret, and there was a lambda. Okay? So what about this story changes when we go to our discussion of the Higgs? So one of the big things that changed when we moved to the Higgs story is that what was a discrete symmetry and what I just talked about, and therefore was kind of easy to think about, is now a continuous symmetry. Because if we plot, um, well actually let me just remind you of what came out of that Higgs story. Uh, so that in the Higgs mechanism, we uh, gauged uh, the symmetry phi goes to uh, some e to the i, e to the i theta phi, because phi is complex and everything is in uh, complex conjugate pairs. Uh, and then we gauged that and we ended up with an overall Lagrangian of the following form. It was a Lagrangian for phi, phi star, a mu. And it had the usual covariant derivatives which required the introduction of a gauge field, a mu. Potential term. So, and then we added in a gauge field kinetic term, which is just the good old gauge field kinetic term we get in electromagnetism because this is an abelian symmetry. And then what we found in analyzing this Lagrangian is we essentially saw there were two, we, we looked at two examples of solutions. There was a symmetric solution when phi was equal to phi star and equal to zero and a mu equals zero. So that was the first example of a solution we looked at yet, uh, Tuesday. And what we discovered was that in this case, the Lagrangian for the fluctuations was the same as the original. And, and that's, that's, that doesn't require any work, right? Because to get the Lagrangian for the fluctuations, you take the field to be the solution plus the fluctuation. But if this is zero, then the field is just the fluctuation. So of course the Lagrangian looks the same, okay? And, of course, you can immediately see that in this case, any symmetry of the original Lagrangian must also be a symmetry of the fluctuations, okay? However, we looked at a second solution, which it will turn out is not symmetric, and we'll explore that in a minute, and that other solution we actually wrote down just as a concrete example, we took the real part of phi to be mu over lambda, the imaginary part to be zero, and then kept a gauge field to be zero. And then we took this and we expanded it in fluctuations around these three things, and we called those fluctuations uh, eta, beta, and of course we just called this a mu. Okay, and what we discovered was in this case, the Lagrangian for the fluctuations, and I'm not gonna write this whole thing down again, I'm just gonna write down the, the important parts, included a massive scalar field eta, a massless scalar field beta, and then a kinetic term for the gauge field 
And the key observation was that we also got a mass term for the gauge field. And then there was a whole like three lines of interactions between all these different fields. Okay? But this was the magic of what we talked about last time. Starting with a theory that had a symmetry, gauging that symmetry, and then giving our gauge field a kinetic term with no mass, if we looked at a solution of this form, then the fluctuations around that solution looked like this, where now magically the gauge field gets a mass term. And it will, for today's discussion, be equally important to realize that, to remember that the eta fluctuation has a mass term while the beta does not. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do now is take this story and frame it in what we did at the beginning of this lecture, where we were drawing pictures of potentials and talking about transformation. So, Graphical representations of these symmetries are a much easier thing to wrap your head around. Okay. So first of all, we have a little bit of an issue because before, in our example, that was the symmetry transformation. So that was just reflection around an axis. Whereas now we're talking about this symmetry transformation. Okay. But how can we visualize that symmetry transformation? How do you visualize multiplication by e to, e to the i theta? Rotation to complex plane. Yeah, it's a rotation around a circle in a complex plane, the unit circle in a complex plane. Okay. In fact, if we actually plot the potential in question, then uh, we're going to have some potential axis. And again, the potential that we're plotting is this. And I'm sorry, I was supposed to have lambda squareds and mu squareds everywhere, and I dropped them. Et cetera, et cetera. No, actually, they're not here. Um, so if I plot this, what I want to do is plot it against its real and imaginary parts of phi. And what we discover is that, um, first of all, if I just constrict myself to the real values of phi 1, Okay, so I ignore the fact that this is complex and I just treat it like a real variable, then secretly it's exactly the same picture I drew for the previous potential. Modulo, it's scaled by mu and lambda, but you know, just for drawing a picture on some axes that I'm not going to label anyway, I can just draw exactly the same picture that I drew before and will. Yes, I'm not going to have phi equals zero at the center. Okay. Um, it's, it's easier for me to draw this picture this way. I'm sorry. <laughs> and now all I have to do is ask myself, okay, um, this is what it looks like if I set phi 2 to 0. It's just phi is a real number and it's the same curve I drew before. And now what does it look like if I let phi 2 be non-zero? Well, again, the symmetry is that I can rotate by a unit circle in the complex plane. So what happens is I draw that unit circle in the complex plane and then this entire curve just gets revolved around that circle. Okay? So, you know, everybody knows what this ends up looking like. It's called the Mexican half potential. I completely 100% agree with you, and my guess at best is that the people who came up with this did not live in Colorado or anywhere near the Southwest for that matter, so they were just like, that looks like a hat of Mexican person wears. That's actually what and we, wait, wait, say it again? You're not making that up? That's no, I'm not making it up. It's called the Mexican <laughs> hat potential. I'm not shitting you. Of course, we would call it the sombrero potential, but I, there's probably an interesting story to that, but my guess is, is that it's someone who was not quite as familiar with mariachi bands and sombreros. But anyway, yes. So it's called the Mexican hat potential. When I refer to the Mexican hat potential, I'm not being some kind of racist. I'm just like, it's that. OK? All right, so um, and this, uh, well, I'll come to that in a second. OK, so um, let's identify now uh, some solutions. OK, remember that we decided last time that constant field solutions would really just amount to 
solving that expression, okay, so if we just look at for constant phi configurations, all we have to do is extremize it, and then we can look at the picture and we immediately notice a solution here. But now we get something more interesting because we end up actually getting a circle of solutions. Okay? And that circle of solutions, as we talked about last time, are the set of phi's whose magnitude squared is just mu squared over lambda squared. Okay. So we get a continuous family of solutions in this case. So um, let me, for the moment, come back to this particular example. Okay. For those of you who didn't watch, that's what I was drawing. And let's go and look at this in the solution. So this particular, ex this particular example corresponds to which solution in that picture, Levi? Should I say that one more time? This particular example here that we talked about last time corresponds to what solution in that picture? Yeah. Well, it looks like you got one solution in the real plane, one solution in the complex plane. So what's the solution in the complex? Well, they're both in the complex plane. One's along the real axis, one's along the imaginary right. axis. So what's the imaginary component? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> that's a zero. That, that, that makes sense. Yeah. That's a zero, and that's. Just mu over lambda. So where in this picture is that solution? Just on the. Uh, solution on the real axis. Yeah, it's right there. Okay. But do we not have a negative solution in this case? Well, this this is positive. Okay. I'm so this particular solution is that point right there. Phi two, the phi two part is zero, and the phi one part is positive mu over lambda. Right. Okay. Then what we did was we said, okay, I'm going to let phi one fluctuate, and I'm going to call that fluctuation eta. Well, if I'm fluctuating along the phi one direction, that means I'm moving up up the sides of this valley. Okay. along the phi 1 axis, okay? However, we also let phi 2 fluctuate, but a fluctuation in phi 2 is really just moving along this circle. It's moving along the valley. Now we notice something. For eta, if you move away from the solution, you've got to go uphill. But for beta, you're just moving along a flat direction. Now there's a significance to that. And the significance is the following. Um, when we consider a Lagrangian for fluctuations, we can ask ourselves, how do I identify a mass term? Well, in any mass term in a Lagrangian that I've written down so far, what has been the form of the mass term generically? Field squared. It's quadratic in the field itself whose mass you're talking about. And there's no other field as part of it. Okay? So for example, uh, for the mass term of the gauge field, we have A times A and then a bunch of constants. Okay? So if I handed you a potential function one way to extract what a mass term might be is to simply look at the second derivative of the potential function. And in fact, the coefficient of the second derivative of the potential function, we can readily identify as 2 times the mass squared. Okay. So again, if I gave you, you know, if I gave you some weird potential function like v phi, so if I said here's a Lagrangian for a scalar field, d mu phi 
d mu phi plus v phi. Okay, if I just handed you that, and then I said, oh, and by the way, v phi is e to the uh, e to the one fifth phi, you know, something like that. Then I might ask you, does this field have a mass? And you might say, no, you did not give it a mass term. You just gave it that weird exponential interaction. And what I would tell you is, yes, I did. Because what you would do is you would expand this exponential in a power series. And one of the terms would be something times phi squared. And that's a mass term. Mass, mass terms are nothing but interactions of a field with itself. This is just a bunch of powers of the field. It's interactions of the field with itself. But it's the particular quadratic one that, that is the mass term. But what this is telling us is that concavity, which is what governs the quadratic term, it's the second derivative of the potential function, concavity determines the mass. Or the mass squared, I should say. Okay, because you know, the mass terms are always, they always enter as mass squared times the quadratic of the fields. So, hold on just a second, Will. So let's now look here. The fluctuations in eta have what concavity? Say it louder. Positive. So the mass squared of eta should be positive. The fluctuations in beta? Zero. That's exactly what we found. In the Lagrangian for the fluctuations, about this particular solution, we found that fluctuations in eta came with a mass term. And the fluctuations in beta did not have a mass term. OK? Yes? What happens at 0, 0? It looks like it has a negative concavity. Excellent question. So what would a fluctuation about 0 look like? Well, what would the mass squared be? Negative. And last time, what we said was, ooh, tachyons. <laughs> and then we said, faster than light. Star Trek Wars. <laughs> but now you realize that m squared less than 0 is not some super sexy particle traveling faster than the speed of light. m squared less than 0 is, yo, bud, you're unstable. If you fluctuate, you're going to roll away from where you started. So in a field theory context, and I said it was a field theory context where this would be given an interpretation that was more important but less sexy. In a field theory context, negative mass squared tachyonic fluctuations are really just saying the solution you're sitting on is unstable. You're not going to be there long. And we know this, if we start here and fluctuate, we're going to roll somewhere else. In particular, we're going to roll down to one of these solutions. So massive or massless fluctuations imply that you're stable. But if you have a single mass or tachyonic fluctuation, then you're unstable. And you can expect that at some point you will evolve to a different solution. Now, I should just to give you some, some nomenclature here. I didn't give these things names, but we should give them names. So I can take a classical solution like phi plus 0 and then look at small fluctuations. Or I can take a classical solution like this one and look at small fluctuations. Well, if I think about the small fluctuations as particles, okay, before I do the fluctuation, I either have this solution or this solution. Well, what do we call physics when we take away all the particles? Easy. <laughs> we call it the vacuum. So to give another name to this, these are different vacua of this theory. Here is an unstable vacuum. It is a vacuum with no particles in it, but it's unstable because it will decay. As soon as a particle exists, that is going to flow down to some stable vacuum. This is a ring of stable vacua of this theory. Okay? 
So where did the where did the mu squared eta greater than zero or equal to zero? Uh, yeah. So the here. So if I think about the concavity along the direction of the eta fluctuation, it's positive. Agree? That's concave up. But concavity is what determines the sine of m squared. But along the, along the beta direction, it's flat. So the concavity is zero, and the mass is zero. OK. Alex, real quick. Yeah. Can you elaborate on what some of those symbols in that second derivative are? Is that you're setting phi equal to phi sub mu, which is equal to 2 mu sub Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes, yeah. yeah. this, this, sorry, yeah, my, my, my writing on my paper is small. That's at the solution. Phi sub. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Well, well, no, no, no. I mean, I can take the, I can look at the concavity of this, of this potential function at any value of phi, but I'm only interested in the value of the concavity at the solutions phi naught. So this ring or that point there. So the the value of the, the the second derivative of the potential at a classical solution is going to control the sign of the mass of fluctuations about that solution. Sorry, that that's an M. Not a mu. This is yeah. an M. Oh, okay. it's an M. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so because we're defining the mass squared in terms of second derivatives of the potential, the p to the fourth will also give it mass because that's going to give non-zero. P to the four will not give you a mass. If we take two derivatives of it though and then give it a non-zero p, evaluate that at the solution. Why would that be zero? If I if uh. If, if I, okay, if I, if I start, okay, so here's a potential expanded, let's just take a real scalar field. So um, we're, we're never going to have a linear term in our potential, so we're going to start with a quadratic term. Here, A, B, let's just take it to be an even function. Okay? If I gave you that function right there, you would say that is associated with the mass. Oh. Yeah, that's the, I just oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, wait. Wait, I see what you're saying. I. I know the solution is going to be on order for you to say. If I, so let's take two derivatives of this. I'm going to get a plus 12b by <laughs> squared plus that of that. And if I plug in the value of phi, if I plug in a classical solution for phi, I'm obviously going to get the quantity A, but I am going to get these other terms, which should vanish at classical solutions, but how can I argue that? Plug in the actual solution or zero? Plug in the. Plug in zero. There you go, man. <laughs> oh! Ah! Uh, oh! Oh! Yeah! 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 No! 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 Sorry! 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 Yes! 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 I'm being yes. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. You don't plug in zero. What? No! 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 no. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm being, I'm being silly, and thank you for clarifying this. Okay, so I said expand this, 
But I should have said, what do I expand it around? I don't necessarily expand it around zero. I would expand it around zero if zero was the classical solution. But what I should be expanding it around is a classical solution, which would be phi naught. And then these terms would have phi minus phi naught. And then after you've taken the derivatives, you're going to get the A contribution from here, because all of these terms are going to disappear. And then all of these are going to have phi minus phi naught. And when you plug in phi equals phi naught, those are all going to go to zero. So yeah, so it does work out for phi equals zero, but phi, is not, phi equals zero is not the only solution. So does everybody understand how that rectifies the situation? OK, good. Thanks for keeping me honest. Um, all right. So in, the, in this picture, we can notice something because where, where is, in this sort of picture up here, where is the original symmetry that sort of motivated all of this discussion? <laughs> so in the picture, what is it? We have a ring of solutions instead of discrete points. Right. So in terms of, OK, so. Sorry. Um, we have we phrased the symmetry here in terms of the field phi. We've looked at a particular solution for the field phi and A. And now we have turned into describing this in the language of fluctuations. So eta's and betas and you know there would be fluctuations in A. So in that language, how would you phrase this symmetry? So you're, you're right, qualitatively, it's moving around the circle. But what is moving around the circle? What is moving in the circle direction in terms of these degrees of freedom? So your, de your degrees of freedom are eta's, beta's, a's. And what I want to do is start right here and move around the circle. What am I using? Beta. I'm using a beta, OK? So the original gauge symmetry becomes a shift of beta. It's not multiplication by a complex number, because beta is a real scalar field now. So rather, it's a shift of beta. It's beta goes to beta plus delta beta. OK? Here's the thing, though. If we have a symmetry under shifts of beta, in particular, if it's a gauge symmetry, and in, in, in time we'll have a careful conversation about what we mean by symmetry versus gauge symmetry or whatever, but just, just to, to throw an idea out there that's relevant, one of the very important observations about gauge symmetry is that really and truthfully, it amounts to a redundancy in your description. Any gauge transformation that you do does not change the physical results. And you remember this from electromagnetism. One of the reasons you talk about electric and magnetic fields instead of potentials is because those are the physical things. The potentials, you can always shift by a gauge transformation. So the potential itself, you argued, is not physically relevant because you can transform it, it's really the fields. So that's your first sort of exposure to this idea that gauge symmetry is a transformation you can do, but it, if you do that transformation, it cannot affect the physical results. So what I'm arguing to you here is, I have this massless scalar field beta that can fluctuate, but I am always free to change the value of beta without changing the physical content of the theory. But that means if beta fluctuates from 0 to 0.1, I can make a gauge transformation and send it back to 0. So I can essentially gauge away any fluctuations in beta. These are non-physical fluctuations. Different values of beta do not correspond to different physics in the same way that different gauges in electromagnetism do not correspond to different physics, because they give you the same E and B fields at the end of the day. Okay, so what we can do is take this and we can gauge away 
gauge away the fluctuation beta. Now in the process of doing that, we lose this term. And the theory that we're left with is essentially a massive scalar and a massive gauge field. So now I'm going to put this story into words. And it's, it's funny, but it's just a way to remember it. So the story is the story of the Higgs mechanism. This Mexican hat potential is just the Higgs potential. Phi is the Higgs field. Okay, we already named that last time. Eta the fluctuation around, uh, uh, up the valley of the potential. And, and notice, we can have an eta no matter which solution we pick. You know, we could pick this solution, and then there would be fluctuations up the valley and fluctuations in the flat directions. So you can define an eta and a beta for any solution that you pick. Eta is what we would identify as the Higgs boson. This is the thing that was experimentally observed four or five years ago. It's a boson. It's a real boson because it's the real part of the Higgs field. It's a massive boson. Okay, I erased the Lagrangian conveniently, but we can look at the picture. Okay, the mass of that fluctuation squared is greater than zero. Beta is generically what's called a Goldstone boson, or a Goldstone mode. And Goldstone bosons are always going to appear any time we have a continuous symmetry that we're breaking in this kind of mechanism. And you can kind of see that because a continuous symmetry means you've got a bunch of values that are connected along some flat direction. And so if you fluctuate along that flat direction, there's always going to be a massless mode associated with that. So the Higgs mechanism is basically the following story. The Higgs field gives a mass to the gauge fields of a spontaneously broken, and I'll come back to what spontaneous means, and it's spontaneously broken gauge symmetry. So remember, this, the gauge symmetry that we started with had the gauge fields A mu, and those are the things that got mass when we kind of broke that original symmetry by going from this solution to this solution. Um, through the coupling to an extra Higgs field phi. Oh, no, 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 through the coupling to, to the Higgs. So it's the, it's, the, it's the strength of the coupling between the Higgs and the gauge field which determines in part the mass of the gauge field itself. And now here's an interesting part of the story. Originally, A mu was massless. It was a massless vector. So as a massless vector, how many polarization states did it enjoy? Two. Okay. For me and M, you remember this is just through observation that electromagnetic waves are or orthogonal, or they're transverse polarized. In terms of the counting of the little group, since it's massless, you can't go to the rest frame, so you categorize things by the symmetry transformations perpendicular to the momentum direction, but that's a two-dimensional plane. And so you have two polarization values. So originally, MU was massless and had two polarizations. Afterwards, MU is massive. 
and has how many polarizations? Three. Three. Nice. Now, a polarization direction is a degree of freedom. Having two versus three is a different number of degrees of freedom. Okay, and you can wiggle in more directions in the massive case than in the massless case. So the question is, where did the photon or the gauge field get that extra polarization? That extra single degree of freedom? And this is a better answer than Mexican hat potential. It ate the Goldstone boson. <laughs> So gen genuinely, you lose one degree of freedom because now shifts in beta are pure gauge. You lose one single real degree of freedom, but you simultaneously gain one single real degree of freedom. Well, there's a, there's a conservation principle that work here. You plus one, you minus one. So clearly, it is in the loss of the Goldstone boson that the gauge field is picking up the extra polarization degree. And so colloquially, people say the gauge field eats the Goldstone mode. OK? All right, now, um, this has been uh, complicated, to say the least. And I want you to realize that um, what we have just done is basically we broke, we broke a U1 symmetry. We broke the simplest possible symmetry you could possibly write down. That's not, of course, what, how this works in the standard model. In the standard model, where this comes into play is the breaking of SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge to U1 electromagnetism, which itself was a really heinous story. So all I'm trying to convey to you is that if you think this was bad, its actual implementation in the standard model is horrific. And so when you look at that standard model Lagrangian that I showed you at the beginning of the semester, or Spencer's pulling up on the phone and asking me about, it looks really, really ugly. And it looks ugly in part because you're looking at the Higgs version of the standard model Lagrangian after you've broken this symmetry. So you've got, I mean, you remember that Lagrangian I wrote up earlier, or last time, and you thought I was never going to stop? That was a U1 case. In the standard model, it's this, OK? So I, 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 all I'm trying to express to you is the standard model Lagrangian is hideous in a certain sense. But what's underlying it are some really nice principles. In particular, there's a lot of symmetry governing it. It's just not obvious that that symmetry is there because a big part of it is broken. It is still there. The standard model Lagrangian is symmetric. If you drew the potentials, they would have the symmetry. But it's spontaneously broken through this mechanism. And it just makes it a lot uglier to look at. Okay. Now, this would explain how we can give mass to gauge fields. We saw that in the, stand in the, in the explicit expressions that we wrote down. We have that other issue of um, this particular symmetry treats left and right differently, so you can't give mass terms to fermions. Okay, But that's actually fine, because what we can do is in our Lagrangian, we can include a term for, say, psi left bar psi right. and we can include an interaction with the Higgs field, phi. Now pay attention. This is not a mass term for psi. It's an interaction between two psi's and the Higgs field phi. OK? So we could write down a Lagrangian for spinners, the matter in the standard model, and give them no mass terms. And that would be fine with this symmetry. OK? We could give them interactions with the Higgs field. Now, they have to be particular forms you know, to, ma to, to maintain the symmetry. But the important observation is the following. Once the Higgs field does its thing and assumes a non-zero 
vacuum value, then this expression is going to become something like this. And if I break it up, it becomes something like this. And now what I've got is a mass term. Because phi naught is a constant. It's not a dynamical field. I still have an interaction between the fluctuations in the Higgs and the, and the fermions. But now I've given the fermions mass terms as well. So the Higgs mechanism can be used to give gauge fields mass when you break a symmetry, but you can actually use it to give everything, all the matter in the standard model mass, just through letting them couple to the Higgs field. So this one mechanism solves both of the mass problems. So there was strong theoretical evidence, and I want you to understand this is driven by a consideration of symmetry. People wanted the standard model to be based on a symmetry principle, even though there was obvious discrepancies, like things had mass when they couldn't have mass in the symmetric version of the theory. The only way around that was to propose this Higgs mechanism. So these, these theoretical considerations is sort of driven by aesthetics. We're, we're pushing people to propose this thing, and of course, you know, we all felt really good a few years ago when this was experimentally observed. Okay? And similar things exist currently, and I'll talk about this tomorrow. We're currently thinking that the next thing that's going to be discovered beyond what we've already discovered in the standard model is something called supersymmetry. And we have a lot of theoretical motivation for why we expect that. Okay? And we'll be really happy if we actually do discover it. Um, it should be right around the corner, but you can come to Physics X tomorrow and hear more about that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna... Oh, so we have, we have actually one more very, very important question to ask, which no one has asked, but I'll ask it. I'll pretend I'm Wolfgang. <laughs> <laughs> That's too fast, you have to go slow. There you go. <laughs> 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 um, Flournoy, I have a question. Um, if, if, if the symmetric version of the theory it happens here, and the broken version happens here, was it ever symmetric? I mean, why the hell would you ever end up there? That was the only place possible to be. Well, this is where the story gets interesting because it turns out that when, and this is something that we will address at the, at the very end of the semester, but to give you a preview of that, when we write down a potential, So if I write down the form of the Higgs potential, it's really governed by two parameters, mu squared and lambda squared. So these mu and lambdas, we can think of them as coupling. They're, they're self-coupling of the Higgs field to itself. Okay? Now they're like the coupling between an electron field and uh, the photon gauge field. In that case, the coupling is just the electric charge. Okay, how strongly you feel electromagnetism is governed by how much electric charge you have. That's your coupling. What's maybe not obvious to you now, but we will learn at the end of the semester, is that coupling constants are, in fact, not constant. They change. The, electric, the charge of the electron is not a constant. It is, for all practical purposes, a constant. Because you never actually do experiments in electromagnetism that get close enough to a charged particle for you to really see a difference. But the truth is, is if you probe closer and closer to an elementary particle, which takes higher and higher energies, you will discover that the values of charges actually change depending on how close you get. Okay, and we'll see this in detail at the end of the semester. But the idea is basically that all couplings vary with energy scale. Okay? Well, these are couplings, and they vary with energy scale. Well, if I shift the values of mu and lambda, that's going to change the shape of the potential. Maybe they actually change sign. And so what we can imagine is that early in the universe, 
when the universe was very hot, everything was highly energetic, then the values of these couplings were such that the shape of the potential actually looked like that. So early in the universe, there was only one solution, and it was a stable solution. So we got there, and we stayed there, and we were happy. Okay? But then as the universe cooled, everything dropped to lower energy densities. So you can actually read the axis like this if you want. As the universe cooled, the energy densities on average dropped, and at a certain point, you, this potential deformed into something eventually looking more like what we worked with today. So the answer for how you might have ever been in this position is that early in the universe that was the only solution and it was stable, but the potential itself evolved with time or with lowering energy to create this being, or to, to deform this into an unstable maximum. And then at some point, the Higgs field had to say, you know what, I can't stay here, I gotta go somewhere. But the direction it went was completely arbitrary. It could have gone here, it could have gone here, it could have gone here, okay? Wherever it went is where we end up today, but it was completely undetermined. It was spontaneous what direction it picked to go. Okay? There's no preference for one direction over the other. All right? Alex? Yeah? Is that to say we, our universe exists on a single point along that? Um, this is, so we are saying that the Higgs field, which has a constant value throughout space and time, okay? If I say the Higgs field is sitting here, then the, the constant value of the Higgs field throughout the entire space-time is this value. And if it later is at this value, then the Higgs field throughout space-time has that value. This is not a picture of space-time. This is a picture of the value of the Higgs field as a function, or, or the potential of the Higgs field as a function of the value of the potential, of the, of the value of the Higgs. So we could take the Higgs field to be at the same value throughout space and time. However, if I take the value of the Higgs field to be that one, so throughout the universe the Higgs field has this value, what I can tell you is that it's going to change with time. The whole universe is going to as the Higgs field goes. Okay? Nathan? Well, yeah, so is that when people talk about like a vacuum decay of the Higgs field, do they mean... That's exactly what we're talking about. Stable vacuum, and then at later times, lower energies, the stable vacuum becomes unstable, and so this is a vacuum decay. And so are they implying that there might be some sort of, what, five to the six, like higher, or, like higher order terms that we're now in some sort of like semi-stable area and it's going to decay at some point? Oh, you're talking about subsequent vacuum decay? Yeah. From oh, we don't know the exact form of the Higgs potential. So yeah, there could be additional terms which at some point, or with the eventual evolution, this form of the potential might get relaxed so that now this is unstable. I mean, maybe it'll just do this. And then we'll have another Higgs mechanism and life as we know it will change. But, but let, let me, so, so this might seem weird, but it's actually a phenomenon that you're very familiar with. So let me just end with an example that I think you'll all be like, oh, really, that's cool. So let's just imagine that we have a lattice, and on that lattice is a bunch of spins. Okay? Now, spin-spin interactions, spins t tend to align or anti-align, but what we can say is, at high temperature, so if I give this lattice of little dipoles, uh, a huge, so these are, good, these are gonna be like magnetic dipoles, okay? So, uh, um, at high temperature, I'm gonna give this thing so much thermal energy that all of these things are wiggling so hard that they're actually completely random. And I'll tell you, the hardest thing in the world is to draw random things, because you always want to start aligning things, okay? But what's gonna happen to this system as we lower the temperature? Align or anti-align. Yeah, well, well, right now, like, these two things kind of want to align with each other, but they're shaking so hard they can't do it. 
Well, as I cool the system down, at a certain point, they get sort of so slow that he's like, hey, buddy, yeah, buddy, let's do it, let's do it. And then they'll align, and then, you know, they're going to grab their neighbor, and they're going to, and you know, for, for each causal domain, which you probably don't really think too hard about in the case of like crystals you can hold in your hand, but in the size of the universe, it's important. You're in, in, a, in a causal domain, you're going to get everything aligned. Okay? Was the direction of this special? No, it could have literally picked any direction. Like it, they could all be aligned this way. So picking the total direction of alignment was completely spontaneous. But here's the thing, which of these two is more symmetric? The top one. The top one enjoys a full three-dimensional rotational invariance. If everything is completely random, you could take the whole thing and rotate it around any axis and it's going to look the same. But once you've cooled it down enough to get alignment, you only have an SO2 invariance. You can only rotate perpendicular to the direction of the alignment and have things look the same. This is exactly spontaneous symmetry breaking. And in fact, you can, if you take a field approximation to describe what's going on, you can describe the physics of this with the Higgs mechanism. Okay, so the Higgs mechanism is not something which only finds utility in particle physics, in cosmology, but it's actually something that's very useful in condensed matter systems and describing phase transitions in condensed matter systems. Nathan? Is this analogy robust enough to say that there could be like domain walls in the Higgs field? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So, so what Nathan is bringing up is that if, if you're doing this throughout the universe, then the universe is so large that when, it, when the Higgs field takes a value over here, the region over here might be causally disconnected because you can only communicate with things at the speed of light. Okay? So if the entire Higgs mechanism happens at a certain, you know, over a certain time frame that's short enough, there's no reason why alignment over here has to agree with alignment over here. And so you can end up just like in magnetic materials with domain walls. So that would be a region that separates different regions of alignment. And what's interesting is in, in, in the magnetic case, you kind of understand domain walls. In the context of, say, breaking a gauge symmetry, what we discover is that these domain walls actually give rise to magnetic monopoles. Because magnetic monopoles are nothing but topologically non-trivial configurations of the gauge field. It's topologically non-trivial because you have a gauge configuration that's all one way in one domain, and then it it discreetly switches in another. So yeah, so these things can exist and they, they give rise to magnetic monopoles and then you have the whole cosmological problem of why don't we see them and inflation addresses that and so forth and so on. So was that where you were trying to make a connection? <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it's going to hurt. Okay, so I was going to give you a couple more analogies but I might just save those for next time. Um, are there any more questions before we get out of here? Uh, so if the Higgs field is metastable, what physically can you do to change uh, like its position on the graph? If the Higgs field is metastable... Or, or just in general, how, how do you move the solution? You mean go, how do you migrate from here to here? Yeah. Like I what don't... physically is happening when that happens? Oh shit, man. Okay, I'm just, I'm, no, I'm just going to do it. I, I came with these freaking... Okay, so... Um, <laughs> So I'm going to give you another way to think about this, which honestly is one of the reasons why I do string theory. <laughs> okay, so for anyone who went to my D-Brain talk, how many of you went to the D-Brain talk? Yeah, you missed it, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm, literally this is gonna be a 30 second introduction to D-Brains, but I'm gonna show you what the Higgs mechanism looks like and you're gonna go, wow, that's cool. Okay, so here's, here are D-Brains. D-Brains are the surfaces in space-time that have P plus one dimensions so they can be many different dimensions, okay? And what's important about D-brains is that they are where strings can end. So a string, of course, is that or that. If you're this, your ends have to be on a D-brain, okay? So it turns out that if I take, say, three D-brains, and these are all stacked on top of each other, 
And I think about what open strings I can have. I can have a string which begins and ends on each D brain. But I can also have strings which stretch between the D brains. Now these open strings happen to be oriented. That is, you can identify a direction along the string. So I have to identify those as different. These I don't because I can always just rotate it. Okay. So then I draw a set of these. Okay, and then I get nine strings, nine open strings. Now what's interesting is if you actually quantize these strings and you study their Lagrangian and you ask, you know, what role are they playing? These nine strings are U3 gauge fields. That is, there is a U, a unitary, so U3 is, you know, it's like SU3 except it's, it's not special. <laughs> it's just unitary. So th these act as U3 gauge fields, like the photons of a symmetry. Okay? And remember, U3 has, well, UN in general has N squared generators. So you need N squared gauge fields. And it probably doesn't surprise you that if I add a fourth D brain here and draw all the strings, I'll get 16 gauge fields. Okay? <laughs> Oh, do I bore you, Ariel? It's a ferocious yawn in the back of the room. Okay, now here's the thing. These are sitting on top of each other. So really and truthfully, these strings have zero length. I mean, they have the string length, but you know, they're, they're really, they're just, they're as happy and as small as they, they, they can be. But now what I want you to consider <laughs> is taking one of these D-brains and moving it. <laughs> I hope it's either pleasurable or somebody's calling somebody about it because that sounds like that sounds rough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So that's what your picture looks like now. All right. But here's the thing: four of these strings have now been stretched. Now, strings are like rubber bands. They have tension. And when you stretch them, that represents an energy which is actually interpreted as the mass of the string. So what is secretly happening here is when I pull one of the D-brains away, four of these gauge fields acquire mass. Four of them remain massless. And that is exactly what you would expect if you took that symmetry and broke it to this one. Sorry, five remain massless. You get a U2 here and a U1 there. This distance right here, that distance is the Higgs field. When the Higgs field was zero, everything was massless and you had this enhanced symmetry. But by giving the Higgs field a non-zero vacuum expectation value, a non-zero value. You break the symmetry to a smaller symmetry, and in doing so, give mass to a certain subset of the gauge bosons. To me, that's the most concrete way of thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I, maybe I just have a comfort level with strings and deep brains that you guys don't, but, but literally, like, I, I cannot think of a more concrete way to think about the Higgs mechanism than that. I guess the question is, what's causing the Higgs field to stretch? How, how do you give it a non-zero value? So, so at this point, there might be a potential, okay, so, so literally, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. So at this point, why do they stay together? Well, it's because no one is grabbing it and pulling it apart. The reason it moves apart is because you reach in and you grab the D-brain and you move it away. That is, your hand is creating a force. There is a potential associated with that, and this is reacting to the potential. It's moving away. Alex, would you find those hands in a bag? Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. So, it's, so the, the thing is, is when I, you know, physics, physics is, if you're going to say that there's something that drives physics, it's generally finding lower energy configurations, right? So if you're here, and you have any way to get there, you're going to go there. 
Of course, if you're exactly here, exactly there, you're not going to go anywhere, but everything is quantum, everything fluctuates. So at some point, you're going to jiggle, and when you jiggle, you're going to go. So the, the seeking lower energy configurations is just it's sort of an underlying omnipresent principle in physics. And so here, if I'm pulling on this to get it away, this lower energy configuration is going to be when this actually relents and goes with the direction of my pull. <laughs> Am I still not answering your question? I mean, what's the pull? That's like, am I physically grabbing this thing and pulling it, or I don't understand what you mean? Well, well. So here, I here. This is a geometric thing, and I can actually try and imagine there being a force acting on it. With with the Higgs potential, it's a, it's a little harder to think of that as a as a force. So instead of thinking in terms of forces, we think of potentials. So I mean, if I have a potential energy function for anything. You know, it could be a, a particle, uh, like a superharmonic oscillator, you know, where I think about uh, what's the potential energy if I displace the oscillator from its rest length along, say, the x-axis. Well, it looks like this. So if I sit there, I'm at zero energy. And if I stretch the, oscill if I stretch the spring away from the rest length, then it's going to go back down to lower energy, but of course, since it's moving, it's going to overshoot, and then it's going to oscillate. And that, be, that explains the behavior of a mass attached to a spring. And you can turn this into a force expression for the force of this, the, the spring on the mass. Still, I still yeah, no, 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 no. You're not waving. Am I still, am I still, am I still not saying it? I think he's confused about what the source of the potential is, yeah, or is it just right. inherent oh, out there? Is it just there? Is it Oh, 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 yeah, so, so, oh, okay, yeah, 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 okay, okay, so there's a, there is a, okay, fair enough, so, <laughs> there is a great part of this story, that's actually a really good question, so I argued that in writing down the standard model, there's a, a form of the interactions that we put in that's governed by symmetry, these gauge interactions. <laughs> And so, after class, I'm going to go find out what's going on. <laughs> I so can you just might... tell you I run that club. Oh, it's a club. Okay. So, so, so you might say, well, if you're just going to throw in this, gate, this Higgs field with this funky-looking potential, that's not really motivated by this same kind of symmetry argument. And I agree with you. But what we will discover at the very end of this class is that secretly, when we write down the Lagrangian for the standard model, we have to actually write down every single possible term you could imagine. Every combination of products, of fields, every interaction you can imagine. And what happens is that most of those are suppressed by a very tiny coefficient. And we work with effectively the ones that are not suppressed. So when, what we're really working with when we deal with the standard model is what's called an effective field theory. But that effective field theory has an infinite number of higher order corrections. So there's a sense in which we were kind of writing down a magical Higgs-Lagrangian, which you might say, why do you, but in reality what we should be doing is writing down the most general possible Lagrangian for every field, including the Higgs, and then that's obviously going to be able to incorporate this mechanism. But understanding why we have those extra terms what I mean by effective field theory, that's going to have to be couched in the context of a discussion of renormalization at the very end of the semester. Obviously. So, so that's where that potential comes from. And you'll have to wait till the end of the semester to get really comfortable with that. Yeah, it's the potential that's like so, 